Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I'm your host, Dr. Nasser, and what's on tap for today? Well, we have got a debate, folks, and it is between the conservative author, Douglas Murray of the United Kingdom, and Flavia Kleiner, who's a leftist socialist Marxist from Switzerland. And this debate was put together by the Forum on European Culture. The Forum on European Culture, folks. And it was a long debate. We've taken it down into different sections. This is part two. And this is where the moderator, Sophie, Sophie Dirksen, is basically introducing Douglas Murray and giving him his introductory statement. So just wanted to let you know that part two is going to be the introductory statement of Douglas Murray. We'll get into our reaction to it. Let's go to that video right now. Um, journalist and a spectator and author of most recently The Madness of Crowds. In 2016, he wrote the book The Strange Death of Europe, in which he argued that Europe faces an ex existential crisis of its own making. Uh, Douglas, for those uh, present here and online who have not read your book, why do Europeans bring about their own demise? In brief, please. I, I will. I'll be as brief as I can be in summing, summing up quite a long book that was the result of an awful lot of research. I'm taking a risk here, um, I know, but please try. But I'll do my best. Uh, yes, the, the book in question actually, of course, isn't about the EU really almost at all. Um, the EU as a structure does crop up uh, intermittently in the strange death of Europe. But really, it's an analysis of what I see as being a set of fundamental questions which Europeans have dodged answering for some years. Uh, let me give you an example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. Um, I was in Doha last year speaking a debate about migration. We were talking about migration across the Middle East, obviously countries taking in people or not taking in people and so on. And there was a statistic I cited there which remains pertinent, which has come out since the strange death of Europe, which was a Gallup poll that took, uh, was taken last January in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And it found that one third of people in sub-Saharan Africa want to move. Now, uh, that's a very large number of people. It's uh, a number of people that's going to significantly increase in the years ahead. And of course, uh, people in question don't want to move to the freedom of the Middle East. They don't want to move to the Gulf states. They, they, they primarily want to move north to Europe, and I don't blame them. Uh, and uh, my book, The Strange Death of Europe, among other things, just asks very fundamental questions, which is, um, could Europe, for instance, take all of these people? Uh, and currently our leaders and our intellectuals, are think. And that's the question that needs to be asked, folks, is that is it possible that poll that he's talking about one third? I would say it's higher than that. But let's say it's lower. Let's say it's a quarter. Is it possible for Europe, predominantly just the United Kingdom, to take in 25 percent? of the population just from sub-Saharan Africa only. Forget the other countries, forget the other continents. If it's just 25% from Africa only, could any country be able to absorb that many people? I'm just saying, folks. Suppose, for example, somebody said, you know, 25% of the over, what, nearly... 2 billion or 1.5 billion people in China? And you were saying that, you know, 25%? So you're talking what? Half a million? Let's say even, I mean, right? 500 million? I mean, is that even possible for a country to absorb that? Could we do that here in the United States of America? These are the questions, okay. See, it's nice to come up and say, yeah, we want people to come over. We want open borders. What's wrong with that? We need to be, um, you know, we need to be, you know, in the 21st century. We have to be open. We have to allow for, you know, all ethnicities, all diversities. Everything should just be open and it just be a melting pot and everybody can come over. That's so easy to say. And that's why it's easy being a leftist, a socialist, and a Marxist, because it's just about feelings, and you can say whatever you want. You know, the heck with whatever the results are going to be. Terrible. It doesn't matter. But at least we feel good. It makes us sound good to other people. We virtue signal this all the time. Let's continue with Douglas. Thinkers and our um, thought leaders 
are incapable really of answering this question. Uh, the answer has to be no, but we don't know how it can be no, because our liberalism, in, in the good sense, uh, wishes us to be open-armed. Yet we know we can't be. And so we live in this hypocritical state for the time being, which is what I expose, what I write about, and what in the strange death of Europe, I suggest, is a serious contention. But why exactly is it a strange death? Oh, lots of reasons. English readers know the, the, the phrase to be borrowed from a famous work of a century ago called The Strange Death of Liberal England, which was, um, is a famous work of history in, in English. Um, but in this it, particular it's, case... It's, it's, it's in this particular case, it's because it is curious. It is, um, it is curious that Europeans find it so hard uh, um, to argue for themselves, to defend uh, what is good uh, in their own culture. I think that there's an embarrassment, an uncertainty about who we can share it with. We've basically, among other things, massively overestimated our capacity to bring people in and underestimated the changes that that brings about. That's exactly true, what Douglas is basically talking about, is, is that everywhere, okay, these liberal policies have underestimated how many um, immigrants or people can you take in from around the world. And so you've underestimated your capacity to do that. At the same time, you basically are sort of now asking what is that doing to the cultural identity, to the demographic identity of the people that were there prior to this immigration shift of people coming in? And in both instances, there were people like Douglas and others that were basically saying, look, this is going to change the face of a country because a lot of people are not assimilating. They don't want to assimilate. They want to bring their culture, their ethnicities, their um, you know, backgrounds, their laws into, you know, the European, you know, the, the European, you know, sphere. And many of those cultures, you know, cultural um, identities, those cultural aspects, those rules of law, whatever you want to call them, they don't fit well with Western society. They're butting heads against those. And so they're just creating problems. And that's exactly what, um, you know, Douglas is talking about here, that they underestimated the effect that it was going to cause. And I think that was out of sheer stupidity, you know, and thinking that nothing's going to happen. And then basically also overestimated their ability to handle the influx of, different, you know, migrating populations coming into Europe. And the same thing is happening in the United States, folks. And by the way, I, I don't see this as being a right-wing, left-wing thing. Uh, it's not a populist versus other people thing. It's a problem that, and a question that has to be confronted in Europe, and which I try to open out and explore, um, which obviously has a, a huge audience of other people who wish to explore it. But there remains a deep unease in the political level across all countries in our continent about how precisely we can talk about this most difficult of issues. Mm. Uh, just, just to be sure, you mentioned migration as one of the most mm. important threats to Europe, but you also claim in your book that the history of Europe is characterized by immigration and influences mm. from outside. What exactly is the difference then with the immigration today? I'll give you an example. Um, uh, for instance, uh, in Britain, we still talk about the Norman Conquest. It was quite, quite an important story in the uh, history of these islands. And the Norman Conquest, which happened a thousand years ago, and as I say, which is still news here, as it were, uh, uh, is thought to have churned about 5% of the population in the UK. Uh, that is, that this massive, massive effect that we still talk about um, uh, of Norman entry into the UK, as we now call it, uh, it was around 5% of the population shifted. And when you look at migration post-war in any European country, you're talking about much more significant percentages than that. And so 
I suggest that in historical terms, what, what we have been doing in recent decades, not through any particular grand evil plan, but just through incompetence and goodwill and things running away and bureaucracies that don't know how to deal with things and kick cans down the road in order that their successors will deal with difficult questions that they don't wish to deal with themselves. Um, as a result, all of these things have happened. And on a historical level, they are at a speed and at a rate which is, um, which is highly uncommon in history. In order to, to come to, to an understanding of your idea of Europe as a place, I, I also quote you, uh, by the end of the lifespans of most people currently alive in Europe, Europe will not be Europe, and the peoples mm -hmm. of Europe will have lost, you wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, they will have lost the only place in the world we had to call home. Mm. What does this home where you speak about look like, and, and, or, or looked like? And why is it in danger, exactly? Who is the danger? Yeah. Well, this is a very, very complex matter, as you know, which I write about in considerable length and depth. There's a lot of historic, history to go through, a lot of philosophy to go through, and a lot of recent facts and, and uh, events. Uh, I suggest it's, it's quite obvious that, for instance, uh, in the last census, I'm, I'm talking here about the UK because it's the country I know best. I know your country fairly well, but let me give you another statistic from the UK. In the UK, in the last census, which the government does every 10 years, it turned out that people who identified as white British, that is, uh, uh, people who we would have described as British a couple of generations ago, and this isn't to say that people can't become British, of course, but uh, the census a couple of uh, years ago said that people who identified as white British were a minority in uh, 23 out of the 33 boroughs in London. Now, if you were born in the uh, 1960s, say, which isn't that long ago, uh, uh, this means a total transformation of the capital city of the country you're in. Now, I suggest that uh, uh, some people deprecate that, some people love it. Most people have a very mixed view towards it. But to pretend that it isn't a, a very significant change to occur in a lifetime is nonsensical. And I just add one other thing to that. There has been a presumption in recent years in Europe, if I may say so, it's particularly prominent in your own country, to assume that historically, whenever you shake the great Rubik's Cube of humanity, it always comes out looking something like the Hague, uh, uh, that everything ends up in the sort of peaceful, decent, liberal settlement that you happily have in your own country. And I suggest that this is simply a, a very serious underestimation of, among other things, ideas that people bring with them, how long it takes for people to hold on to ideas, how long it takes to lose them. And particularly, the, the struggle, which I don't need to tell you, your country has gone through a lot in recent years, the, the serious struggle that liberal societies in the true sense of the term have uh, about what they do uh, regarding the integration of people who, who may not want to join all the elements of the society. What do you do? Uh, our answer is you sort of fudge along for a bit. Uh, I suggest that if we solve this sort of problem, it'll be done not by pretending that it's invented by, you know, crazy theorists or something, but by recognizing that there are a set of competing problems that we face, a set of competing virtues is what I describe it as in the Aristotelian sense. A set of competing virtues, which in the case of Europe in the 21st century, are a competition between justice and mercy. That is, we wish to have justice uh, um, for people coming, we wish to have mercy to people fleeing uh, other places, but we also need to have a sense of justice for people in Europe who pay their taxes, who have um, been decent citizens, and, and need to be asked if there are going to be massive societal changes that will take place, because we're not petri dishes, we are, we are countries. Douglas, thank you very much. Before we have to leave something for people to, to read your book, so I'll, I'll stop you here. Thank no. you. So I'm just going to stop here, basically, and say that there's a couple of things here that I want to point out and react to. One of the things was he was talking about this assimilation, and I talked about that a little earlier, and the assimilation of different people in different cultures and how long it's going to take them to assimilate. The ideas that they're bringing from the others, how, how much of those ideas do they want to inculcate in the new country that they're coming into? And then how long would it be for some, for how long does it take for some of those ideas to basically, you know, go away? I mean, we're talking, that takes generations, folks. It doesn't happen in just the first generation. And this whole thing between justice and mercy, I thought Douglas put it, very, very nicely, saying we all want, we all looking for justice. Everybody's looking for justice for everybody. Everybody wants mercy for everyone. 
but can you deliver it to the entire world? Who is responsible for that? Each and every country is responsible, but first, mercy and justice for their own citizens and the own people within the confines of their boundaries is what I say. So if you have people that are like, you know, white Europeans, and now you've got other ethnicities, other demographics, other, you know, ethnicities that are there, of course you want um, mercy and justice for them. But if you don't have mercy and justice and you're not being able to solve the situation and all the problems that are occurring with the people currently in your country, how do you expect to handle the problems of all the new influx of people from different parts of the world coming in with all their problems and all their cultures and all their needs and wants and desires in, in sort of in the new world, in Europe and in the Americas. Those are really questions that people need to think and people need to ponder. And the left out there basically says it's an open door, kumbaya, come on in. And people on the conservative side are saying, look, we want immigration, but it has to be slow. We just can't welcome the whole world immediately and everybody all at the same time. Look at what's happening right now. Anyways, folks, we appreciate you taking the time to watch. This was part two of our debates. Look down below. You'll see the links. Check out our files and videos uh, that we have on YouTube for the other parts to this um, debate between Douglas Murray, Douglas Murray and uh, Flavia Kleiner. And uh, you've been watching the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I've been your host. My name is Dr. Nasser. If you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Like, share, and follow us. Let us know what you think in the comments below. And I'll leave you with my final thought, which is, when you're right, you're right. And when you're left, you're wrong. We'll see you again next time, folks. Take care and stay safe.